All right, there we go. Um, so yeah, the whole point of this seminar really was to um, help my amazing Aunt Siobhan because she's going to be making the very <laughs> long trek from Ireland to Tanzania. I looked it up on Google a few days ago and as the crow flies, it's 7,760 kilometers from Ireland to Tanzania. And I think it's it's even longer, um, you know, if you're to do multiple trips or not go as the, as the crow flies. So it's going to be a long trip. And, you know, I wanted to help Siobhan to raise some funds um, for uh, Tanzanian Heavenly Homes because it's a really good cause. So if you'd like to donate to that, um, I can send you the link or the link is in the email reminder um, for the, the GoFundMe page. Um, so yeah, best of luck, Siobhan, with your trip. And I hope it goes well. And uh, I hope the seminar this evening is, you know, interesting and hopefully, you know, can share some insights and ideas with you that are helpful. Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, so in 2016, I got my BA in sports management and coaching. I've been self-employed since May 2017. Um, so for about four years, I was working uh, in a couple of different gyms in Leeson Street, um, really doing a mixture between one-to-one -one and group training and worked with hundreds of different clients, both uh, male and female. Um, I ran some seminars and some programs uh, for companies. I suppose the two most notable ones are for Coinbase, which is a multi-billion dollar company. I ran a health and wellness seminar for them. And then I also did a seminar and a employee training program for another billion dollar company called IHS Market. Um, so, um, you know, that was a really good experience. Um, also reinvesting in my education has been super important. So I've reinvested more than 15,000 euro at this point over the last kind of three or four years into a lot of books, courses, masterminds, counseling, and I was just trying to, you know, learn more and improve. Um, traveling is something that I love to do. So last year I actually moved to Barcelona, I lived there for three months and I lived in Sicily and Palermo for two months. And recently I've been really enjoying spending some time with my girlfriend, Alicia at home in Ireland and going to the sauna and just having some chill time. And also two of my favorites in the world are, uh, Ovi on the left and Mushka on the right. Unfortunately, they're not mine. Uh, Ovi is my parents and Mushka is my girlfriend's family's cat. Um, but yeah, they're like um, two of my favorites in the whole world, pretty much. Um, so what I do is essentially holistic health coaching. Um, and so what that means is, you know, I basically help women with their physical, mental and emotional health. Uh, health and you know, really, my main goal is to just help women feel their best and I often get asked, you know, what kind of got me interested to want to work with women specifically. And I suppose there's kind of like three main things. And the first one would be, you know, I've seen a lot of women close to me um, have their health affected in many different ways and, you know, live with pain and migraines and lower back pain and have their quality of life affected. So that's definitely had a big impact to me. You know, I wanted to try and help as many other women as possible to have a high quality of life and you know, live it pain free and, um, you know, to be able to feel their best. Also, you know, from working with a lot of women over the last four or five years, I've noticed that, um, you know, there's just not a lot of open discussion around really important topics like menstrual cycle, perimenopause, menopause. And then there's also just not a lot of good information that circulates around. Um, and then the third one would be that I've also noticed that a lot of coaches tend to take strategies that are kind of designed for men and then apply it to women and that ends up nearly leaving in a worse place than when you started and I've just seen a lot of my female clients kind of being before we started working together going around and around in circles for years and always being stuck with the same problem and never actually you know finding a solution for it so they're kind of like the three main reasons why I kind of got into holistic health coaching um, and I'm just going to stop the share for one second, and then I'll bring it back. I'm going to get some of my notes up, so I want to make sure I cover everything properly. 
Um, just a little bit of housekeeping for this evening as well, guys. I want you to take notes as we go through everything. Um, so if you have a pen or a piece of paper or your phone there, whatever is kind of easier for you, I'd like you to um, I'd like you to take notes as we go because essentially by the end of the seminar, I'd like you to have either a lot of clarity on maybe what you're struggling with or a lot of clarity on maybe what you need to do moving forward from here to allow you to feel your best physically, mentally, and emotionally. And, and how we'll do that is, you know, I'll ask some questions as we go. And um, so ideally, by the time we finish, um, you'll have a whole page or two of different stuff wrote down and then hopefully some, you know, questions for me too. Um, and yeah, so we'll, you know, I'll, I'll take about 15 to 20 minutes at the end for a Q and A. So as we go throughout the seminar, you know, as um, if you have any questions. Um, okay, so sorry, excuse one sec. There we go. So yeah, uh, if you have any questions at all, just write them down either uh, in the chat or on a piece of paper, and then I can uh, go with them. Um, you know, I'll go through them with you uh, towards the end. So um, to get into the seminar, you know, there is a lot of different stuff to cover. And um, I mean, you know, I've worked with people for years and we haven't even covered everything in depth. So I'm really going to do my best to I'm not going to go super deep on anything this evening, but I'm going to go as wide as possible and hopefully give you as much info on loads of different things. So that's kind of a brief overview of what we're going to go through today. Increasing energy, mental health, overview of your menstrual cycle working with your body, um, body composition versus the scales, uh, a few things around perimenopause and menopause. And then I'll also give you a bunch of references and resources at the end of different kind of books and stuff that I've read over the years that should be helpful. Um, so if I was to try and make it super simple and distill everything down, like if I want you to take anything away from today, it's going to be the seven pillars of health and well-being. And if I wanted to make it even simpler for you, the three kind of main things to focus on would literally be sleep, food, and exercise. Um, I know I have seven there, but if I wanted to keep it super simple, it would literally be those three. Sleep is at the top for a reason because it's literally going to be the foundation of your health. So the same way with your house, you know, if you didn't have a foundation underneath your house, it's pretty much going to crumble away, you know, after a short time. And it's the same with your health. Your health is going to slowly crumble away and get worse if you're not prioritizing your sleep. So that's literally going to be number one. The quality of your food then is going to be number two. And when it comes to food, I suppose the most important thing to figure out is how much calories that you need for your body and for your activity level, because um, that's going to be slightly different for everybody. Um, and then once you figure out how many calories you need, also understanding what balance of macronutrients you need as well. So protein, carbs, fats, fiber, um, and they'd be the two main things to kind of focus on with food. Um, hydration is pretty obvious, you know, just making sure you can get at least a liter and a half to two liters of water uh, per day. Managing stress is going to be really important as well. So the main thing when it comes to stress is um, ideally you don't want to be over a seven out of 10 stress wise. Um, for a long period of time like if you're over seven out of ten for more than one or two days then it's a sign that you know we definitely need to do something to bring your stress levels down ideally training minimum like two times a week so that could just be for you know 20 to maybe like 30 minutes and um, doesn't have to be a super long session that you don't even need to go to the gym like you could literally do that from home but getting in at least two kind of strength-based training sessions per week is going to be really important um obviously you know, uh, there's going to be a lot of crossover with things. So um, managing your mental health um, is it's going to be made easier by everything that I've already listed, you know, by improving your sleep and food and managing your stress. But just being aware of your mental health and um, knowing how to uh, feel as good as you can as often as possible is really important. And then tracking your data is really essential. So knowing what your rest and heart rate is, knowing what your blood pressure is, um, if you are, you know, going to be training or doing workouts on a regular basis, keep in a logbook of, you know, what your personal bests are and how many reps you can do on different exercises to 
uh, you know, make it easier to stay motivated and on track with things. So, so that's the first thing that I would like you to write down for today. Out of those seven, which do you feel like you need to focus on a bit more? And then maybe just pick one or two. All right, so um, when it comes to sleep, um, the most important thing really to take away from today is the impact of blue light on your sleep. So um, any time you spend watching TV or on your laptop or on your phone, um, especially in the evening time after the sun sets, that's gonna have a direct impact on the quality of your sleep and then how you feel the next day. So this is gonna be like a really important thing to audit. I want you to write down, you know, um, what's the time period at nighttime between you actually, you know, um, turning off all electronic devices um, and then going to sleep? Because ideally you want it to be about 30 to 45 minutes just to allow your, your brain to settle down uh, and to improve the quality of your sleep. Um, and the reason for that is to do with melatonin and cortisol. Um, so... Basically, they're like two really important hormones. So if you look at the red line there, you can see like underneath the sun, um, your melatonin levels will gradually start to rise, um, you know, from kind of around eight or nine. As soon as the sun starts to set and, you know, the moon starts to come out, your melatonin levels are gradually going to start to come up. And that's what's actually happening inside your body that's sending you the signal to fall asleep so ideally you should be falling um starting to feel sleepy around kind of 10 or 10 30 and that's um a sign that you have you know really good um healthy kind of melatonin production and then you know melatonin is going to peak and you're going to fall asleep uh hopefully around 10 30 or 11 and then it's going to peak at around like two or maybe three um at night and then you can see the crossover here of like melatonin and cortisol. So cortisol is your stress hormone. And cortisol is really important because if you didn't have it, like you basically wouldn't have any energy or probably won't be able to wake up in the morning. So to be able to really feel your best, to optimize melatonin production in the evening or when the sun sets, ideally you want to reduce blue light as much as possible. Um and then that's actually going to help with an increase of cortisol in the morning. So it's going to make it easier to get up out of bed, hopefully not hit the snooze button three or seven times. And then also just be able to have energy and feel good and, and make it easy, you know, to get going with your day. Um, so like high energy in the morning starts with really optimizing your sleep the, the night before. Um, and so taking into consideration um, cortisol and melatonin is like really important. So what I'd like to do now is write down what time do you generally fall asleep and then uh, what time do you generally, you know, wake up at in the morning. So uh, just to give you a little bit more info around, um, you know, melatonin and cortisol, and it's essentially called your circadian rhythm. We, you know, to be able to feel your best, you want to essentially optimize your circadian rhythm. And um, this is an example of kind of, what a full kind of circadian rhythm looks like or you know what a full day would look like in terms of what happens with your hormones and stuff like that so we already talked about melatonin secretion kind of starts around nine o'clock then you're going to start to feel sleepy deepest sleep is usually around 2 a.m um like around 6 a.m your blood pressure is going to start to rise that's due to cortisol so now your energy is starting to come up melatonin secretion stops at about half seven and then as mel as cortisol gradually keeps going up you know you're going to be at your highest alertness usually around 10 o'clock in the morning and then when it comes to about two or three that's going to be one of the best times to you know do a workout or do some stretching and um, obviously like this is the ideal situation and you know um we nobody has a perfect or ideal life but at least this gives you a bit of a framework to know of you know, at what point in the day um, you're going to be able to be at your best or perform at your best, um, you know, to do certain things. So you can kind of design your day around this as best as possible uh, when it comes to maybe workouts or going to bed maybe a bit earlier or, you know, different things like that. So really having your lifestyle in sync with your circadian rhythm is, you know, um, really important thing to take into consideration. 
So we kind of already talked about it when it comes to increasing energy levels. Um, but using food as fuel is going to be really important. So uh, a lot of people tend to think like, oh, I better, uh, you know, have less fat in my diet or I better have less carbs or less protein. But the truth is, you know, we need all macronutrients to, to give us energy. So having a, a balance of, you know, protein, carbs, fats, and the right amount of calories every day is going to be really important to optimize your energy. Um, kind of already talked about deep sleep. Um, so, you know, the more deep sleep you get, the more energy you're going to have in the morning time. Um, if you want a number to aim for, ideally you want to have at least 90 minutes of deep sleep per night. And if you have like a, an Apple watch or any smartwatch, um, it should track your deep sleep for you. Um, other simple ways to increase your energy levels. Not everyone's going to be a fan of this, but cold water always works because it's going to help, you know, bring up your adrenaline. So doing a sea swim or getting into the lake, um, or you can do the opposite. You know, you can always do hot therapy like sauna um, staying optimistic. Um, and of course, training is going to be a huge part. Um, so the reason why I wrote in training is because training is essentially exercising with purpose. So that's really important, you know, especially if you want to get fitter, stronger and, and really feel your best. So, you know, having at least two sessions in there per week, that's going to help increase, you know, your dopamine levels, your serotonin and, um, you know, help to keep your energy as, as high as possible. So um, what I'd like to do is just take a minute. We're going to do a little exercise and uh, I'd like to write down a couple of things. So something that I find works well is basically taking some scores and doing like a, a bit of a, a check-in. So just going to take a minute. And first of all, what I'd like you to do is for how you're feeling right now, I'd like you to write down uh, on a scale of one to 10, where your happiness levels are today. So 10 would be super happy. One would be not so happy. So just take a second to write that down. All right, next one then is gonna be your energy levels. So you're gonna rate your energy levels on a scale of one to 10, 10 being super high, one being really low. Uh, next one is going to be your stress levels. So 10 would be really high stress. One would be really low stress. Mine are about 11 out of 10 now with the pressure of making sure I'm going to get everything right here. <laughs> and then the last one is going to be your anxiety levels. So 10 out of 10 would be high anxiety. One out of 10 would be, you know, no anxiety pretty much. So that's a really simple kind of exercise you can do, you know, once per day, once per week, um, you know, but it's a good habit to get into because at least if you check in with yourself and you realize like, oh, my stress levels are actually nine out of 10 today, it brings some awareness to that. And then you can think like, okay, well, what is going to be a positive way for me to actually bring the stress level down to maybe a five or six, so I'm not pulling my hair out. So it can be really, you know, a powerful thing to do because it can give you an indication of maybe what you need to change or maybe what you need to do for yourself. So that brings me nicely into, you know, discussing how do we actually manage stress, you know? And I think, I know for myself in the past, I've definitely uh, used food as a way to manage stress, binge eating, eating lots of chocolate, ice cream, um, you know, not managing stress in the, in the best way, really, or alcohol, you know, it's, I think there are two really common things that a lot of people probably don't talk about often is, you know, either using alcohol or food or both to try and manage stress. And while there's nothing wrong with drinking alcohol or eating chocolate ice cream, it's about, you know, making sure we're doing it for the right reasons. So um, I think having a self care routine is a really powerful thing to do, because at least if you know, like, okay, here's five things I can do today, that will allow me to feel better, less anxious, less stressed, then that's, you know, very empowering. So that'll be the next thing that I'd like you to do. Just write down really quickly, what are like three to maybe five things that you enjoy doing that you could essentially create a self-care routine out of. And it, it can literally be anything, you know, for me, um, training has always been a go-to for me. So, you know, it could be doing a workout from home, could be a workout in the gym if you like that could be going out for a long walk could be going for a run could be going for a sea swim going to the lake for a dip going for 
a hike up a mountain, walk in a forest, um, having a Epsom salt bath, lighting some candles, going to the cinema. You know, everyone has different things that work for them. Um, but at least if you have a list of your five or seven or 10 things that you can do um, for your own self-care, then it's going to make everything go a lot smoother, uh, especially with your mental health. Um, so in the past, I've worked with a counselor. I found that really helpful for my mental health because uh, I've definitely, I've always struggled with low mood and, and feeling depressed even since I was young. So to manage that is like really important. So if you haven't worked with a counselor before, I mean, that's definitely a good shout. As we already talked about training, exercise and more purpose, journaling is a good thing to do. Um, if you've been taking notes, you're essentially journaling already, maybe without even realizing it. Um, practicing gratitude. So just being like, okay, like what are three things that I'm grateful for today? You know, so for me right now, I'm feeling grateful that, you know, you're all here. I'm grateful that, you know, I am have good health to be able to present this and share ideas. And I'm also grateful for the fact that, um, you know, I have a nice house to live in and I'm feeling, you know, pretty good overall. Like you can literally practice gratitude for anything. It could be big, small things. It doesn't really matter. Some other things that work well, guided meditation, uh, being out in nature. And then also something that maybe a lot of people don't spend enough time on is, you know, taking 10 or 15 minutes to write out both your personal and professional goals. So there's a really good framework for this that I use called the five F's. Um, they're essentially fun, fitness, future, family, and finances. Don't ask me to repeat that because <laughs> I'm happy I got it right the first time. <laughs> but they're kind of, that's a really simple framework that you can use. So fun, family, finances, future, and fitness. I might have said it differently the first time, but you get the idea. So being able to set goals for both, you know, personally and professionally is, is really important. Um, all right, so we can just take a minute. Um, I'm going to grab a drink of water and then I'm going to go into a little bit more about menstrual cycle and perimenopause and menopause and, and stuff like that. As I said earlier, you know, if anybody has any questions, um, I'd like you to either write them down on a piece of paper or you can pop them in the chat because uh, I have my phone open here as well. So I can read any questions that you have um, and then I can you know, answer towards the end. And um, I just I always find like doing a presentation, you know, it can be easy to forget a question, you know, if you leave it too long. So literally as your as a question pops into your mind, you know, just uh, write it down and then you know, I'll make sure to be able to go through it with you. So um, to make the menstrual cycle as simple as possible, it's essentially broke up into four different sections. So we've got uh, the follicular phase and the luteal phase and the follicular phase at the start from day one to day 14, we've got early follicular and late follicular. Um, and then the second half of the cycle is the luteal phase. So early luteal and late luteal. Um, obviously, you know, not everybody's cycle is going to be 28 days long. This is just used for, you know, simplicity. Some people have 23 day cycles. Some people have 38 day cycles. Um, so, you know, don't really worry about the, the time frame. but, you know, this is just a kind of a really easy way to kind of understand it. And depending on what phase you're in, it's going to make quite a big difference to how you feel and kind of the best way to structure maybe your food, your training. Uh, how hard you're pushing yourself um because as you can see there's a lot of different hormones that tend to change from um you know each part of the cycle so a really easy way to break it down is essentially in the first half of your cycle you're going to have higher energy you're going to have increased strength i've seen it firsthand uh that some of my female clients have gained up to 30 or 40 percent in strength in the first half of their cycle and they can lose 30 to 40 percent of their strength in the second half of their cycle and that's literally just because um estrogen peaks more towards the first half of your cycle so it makes a big difference with your strength um also going to have less fatigue less cravings and in general just going to feel a lot better 
and then getting into the luteal phase or the second half of your cycle, it's usually going to be the opposite of that. So generally your energy levels might drop. As I said, strength wise, you can lose up to 30 or 40% strength, but that's just a temporary fluctuation due to estrogen. Um, might feel more fatigued. Um, also a big, um, a lot of feedback that I get is that in the last, you know, maybe five to seven days of your cycle, a lot of women struggle with lower mood. And that is due to your dopamine and serotonin, two really important neurotransmitters that are responsible for allowing you to feel good. They're generally lower because of progesterone. It drops off towards the end of your cycle. Um, and then, of course, you can have more cravings, hunger. Um, migraines and headaches are also quite common as PMS symptoms. Um, and this is a kind of a chart that I'll... I'll kind of reference the book at the end. Um, but this is a chart that makes it kind of nice and easy to see a breakdown of what generally happens, you know, in terms of where hormones are at, insulin sensitivity, uh, you know, hunger, water retention, all that kind of stuff. Um, so if you want, you can always just take a screenshot of that chart and it gives you a kind of a simple breakdown of what can generally happen um, during um, a cycle. So moving on to the scales, you know, I think it's really important to talk about the scales because I've seen it with a lot of women over the years um, that it's very easy to base your self-worth on a number. And, you know, what I generally say to most people is if you have a scales in your house, either bring it back to the shop, put it in the attic or throw it in the bin. Do one of those three because, you know, it is for not for everybody, but for a lot of people, it can have a negative impact on your mental health. And at the end of the day, you know, the most important thing is that you just feel good overall, that you feel good in your clothes and you don't need a number to tell you that you feel good. Right. Um, and as well, if anybody's wondering about the BMI, BMI is a very like old outdated thing and that doesn't really even apply anymore. So I'd highly recommend if you, you know, have been stepping on the scales a lot, really just get rid of it and focus on positive things, you know, focus on your energy levels, keeping your stress levels lower, how much, you know, uh, steps you're doing per week or you know personal best in your training or trying to focus on as many positive things as possible and then that's going to allow you to feel a lot better and not have to worry you know about a number um and also you know there is a best time to you know take measurements and that's essentially going to be um if you have a regular cycle it's going to be about three to five days after your period has finished because that's generally when you're going to be at your lightest so by measurements i mean tape measurements or um you know just retrying on some clothes to see how they feel um but definitely staying away from the scales um if you're in um menopause then essentially what you want to do is just once per month uh pick a day once per month and then you can kind of redo your measurements every kind of 30 days um to have an idea of where you're at and uh this is kind of just a simple you know, way to kind of look at it in terms of why weight loss is not important. Um, what's really important is body composition. So how much muscle you have in your frame and how much body fat you have in your frame is the most important thing, not the weight on the scales. Because as you can see, you could literally have two women who are like 130 pounds or like, let's say 60 or 70 kilos. And both of those women could look very differently because, you know, if you have more muscle on your frame, you train more regularly, um you take care of your food more you sleep more you keep stress lower generally that's going to have a very positive impact on not only how you look physically on the outside but also your health on the inside with your gut health your bone health and a lot of different blood markers rest and heart rate all that kind of stuff but i just wanted to you know share that image so you get an idea of why weight on the scales is, is not really important um, so if I was to try and break it down and, and give you some takeaways when it comes to the menstrual cycle, um, essentially again, seven and a half hours sleep per night is going to be really important. Keeping your stress as low as possible, higher protein intake. Um, so I want you to write this down. Ideally at a at minimum every day, everyone should have at least one gram of protein per kg of body weight. So just write that down. One gram of protein per kg of body weight. So that's at the very least, that's just to avoid disease and avoid issues. But if you really wanted to feel your best and not have any issues with cravings <laughs> or hunger or anything like that, especially in the evening time, then make sure that you're maybe having anywhere from 
1.3 to 1.5 grams of protein per kg of body weight. So if you weigh 60 kilos, you're going to ideally have about 80 to 90 grams of protein per day. And I can guarantee you, if you take away anything from today, that would be the one thing that helps you get rid of any cravings or hunger that you might have in the afternoon or the evening or any time of the day. So it's, it's actually a, a pretty simple fix, but it's just about figuring out what your favorite protein sources are. You know, depending on whether you're, you like me, so you're pescatarian or vegetarian or vegan, you know, everyone will have their own unique kind of um, things to figure out when it comes to food. Um, magnesium is also a really important thing to consider. So um, as you can see, there's a crossover between a lot of things. So uh, magnesium is going to help support you in a lot of ways. Uh, sleep is going to be the first one because it's going to help you uh, sleep deeper, sleep for longer. If we go back to the the uh, slide all the way back here on melatonin and cortisol, it's actually going to, magnesium is going to help support your body to produce more melatonin, have more serotonin, um, basically allow you to have deeper sleep and then optimize your circadian rhythm better, allowing you to have more energy. And then obviously, if you have more energy in the morning, it makes it easier to you know, be in a better mood, it makes it easier to get maybe a workout done, maybe more steps. And then you get into a very positive cycle of, you know, feeling recharged, doing positive things for yourself, uh, focusing on self care. So if I was to recommend any supplement, you know, magnesium bisglycinate, so it has to be that one in particular, magnesium bisglycinate, I know that's a bit of a mouthful, it's B I S G L Y C I N A T E. Magnesium bis bisglycinate is kind of the most bioavailable form of magnesium and um, is really going to give your body a lot of extra support. And the crazy thing about it is it's used in so many different reactions in your body. It's like you could probably name something and I could probably say, yeah, it's going to help with that. So PMS symptoms, uh, you know, like migraines or headaches or, um, you know, lower, mo lower mood, it's going to help with a lot of PMS symptoms. Um, so then moving on to perimenopause, uh, perimenopause is generally considered the two to 10 years before menopause, and is known essentially as the estrogen roller coaster. And that's, um, you know, displayed quite nicely here on this graph. So you can see the, um, the red line is estradiol or estrogen. So generally, the further somebody gets into perimenopause, their estrogen basically starts going on a roller coaster like this. And that can be one of the main causes of hot flushes, night sweats, um, seeing a big increase in your body temperature and, you know, all of the associated common symptoms that come along with perimenopause. Um, so to be able to help manage, you know, um, some of those common symptoms that you get in perimenopause, you can probably guess magnesium again is going to be, it's one of the most recommended things when it comes to like endocrinologists in terms of what's actually going to help support your body the most. Uh, when it comes to things like hot flushes and night sweats, um, in my experience, working with people, supplementing with sage works extremely well to help reduce the intensity of hot flushes or night sweats. And there's, um, you know, a lot of good anecdotal evidence uh, as well as actual hard data in terms of studies on that. So if you do struggle with hot flushes or night sweats, Sage could be a good shout to go uh, to kind of try out. Um, so just kind of conscious of the time, we're going to try and get through as much as possible. So essentially when it comes to perimenopause, the three main takeaways will be, again, you know, using magnesium, um, addressing the potential symptoms. So if you do struggle with, you know, hot sweats or night uh, hot flushes or night sweats or anything like that. Um, you could try out something like Sage. But honestly, if you are to look at everything that we've covered already today with regards to sleeping better, optimizing, optimizing your circadian rhythm, keeping stress lower, having a self-care routine, training a bit more often, um, all of those things are going to work synergistically together to also reduce common symptoms and to allow you to feel better. So that's the great thing about um, when you focus on kind of three or four areas in particular, it tends to improve nearly everything with our bodies. Um, 
So moving on to menopause. So officially menopause begins one year after your final period. Um, and I think one of the most important things when it comes to menopause is to think about osteoporosis because um, essentially in the first five years of menopause, most women are going to lose up to 10% of their uh, bone mineral density. And that's what leads to osteopenia and osteoporosis essentially being one of the biggest health risks for women in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and so on and so forth. Like we probably all know somebody that is in their 60s or 70s that's, you know, fell and they fractured or broke something like that's just such a common thing. And obviously, we want to try and avoid that as best as possible. So the best way we can do that is um, true strength training. That's kind of the main way um, that you're going to increase your bone mineral density. Um, and there's a really good list that Dr. Geraldine Pryor, she's an endocrinologist, uh, she, gave, she gave out like an A to H. So A would be active, um, you know, trying to get a certain amount of steps in each day, ideally maybe somewhere between five to 10,000 steps is going to depend on the person. Um, B is for brawny. So ideally strength training, you know, you want to get in two to three workouts per week. Um, C is for vitamin C. So your doctor is going to give you a recommendation uh, on that. Vitamin uh, D is going to be for vitamin D. Um, your doctor is also going to give you a recommendation on those two, which is going to help a lot with bone health. Um, e is for um i think it was for estrogen i'll have to go back to my notes just give me one sec i have all of these laid out in the notes here oh yeah here we go so B is for brawny, C for calcium, uh, D for vitamin D, E is for easy going, so keeping your stress levels low, uh, F was for bone formation, and G and H is for good habits, so sleep per night, ideally try not to smoke, keeping alcohol as low as possible, um, and having a good balance you know, with protein, carbs, fats. Um, so that's like the A to H that Dr. Geraldine Pryor, a uh, leading endocrinologist when it comes to female health. Uh, recommends and that is essentially everything um for today um so if anybody has any questions um as i said just pop them in the chat um and i'll be able to answer them live um i really appreciate your time and coming this evening i hope some of that was helpful and hopefully you've taken lots of notes and have a bit more clarity on um maybe what's going well and maybe what you need to spend a bit more time focusing on um, and as I mentioned at the start, in terms of references and resources, that's just a few that you can start with. So the top one there is SEMCOR. It's a center for um, menstrual cycle research that's uh, run by um, Dr. Geraldine Pryor. And then also a few really good books I'd highly recommend, The Period Repair Manual by Lara Bryden, Hormone Repair Manual by Lara Bryden also, um, Estrogen Storm Season, uh, the women's book by Lyle McDonald, um, and then preparing for perimenopause and menopause by Dr. Louise Newsom. So there's uh, more than probably a couple of thousand worth, uh, a couple of thousand pages worth of reading there that I keep you busy. But, um, you know, I've essentially condensed everything that I've learned from those books and more um, into everything today. So um, thanks, Emil, for coming and we really appreciate your time. So in terms of uh, questions, all right, so um, Ashling said, best supplement you would recommend for hormone related headaches? Yeah, so uh, magnesium bisglycinate would probably be the, the main one to, to go with. Um, and then also, in terms of hydration, would highly re recommend making sure um, you know you have enough electrolytes each day. So um, staying hydrated is going to be a huge part of keeping headaches at bay. 
So the simplest thing to do would be to use like diorolite, just making sure that you're getting enough potassium, sodium, chloride, and some other essential electrolytes. Um, so I think they're two of the main things um, that I've noticed over the last few years work extremely well to either get rid of headaches or reduce the intensity of migraines or maybe even get rid of migraines completely. I've had some people say that even just by using the magnesium, um, they've completely got rid of their migraines. Um, so it's really powerful stuff to, to maybe try out. Um, if you want a good place to get it, I buy the magnesium bisglycinate off um, Strom Sports. Um, and I think it's like about 20 euro for like a two month supply. So that one works quite well. Uh, yeah, it's Strom Sports, uh, S-T-R-O-M. Uh, there's a few like, there's a few different companies that have it. The, the actual name of the, the supplement company that makes the magnesium is called Supplement Needs. And I've just found that they have the kind of highest dosage and you only have to take one capsule as well. So if you're not a fan of taking, you know, many capsules or pills, then that's kind of the, one of the best ones to go with. Um, Mags asked, how do you measure the protein levels in food? So really good question. The easiest way to do that would be to use my fitness pal and my fitness pal is a free app that you can download off the app store. And honestly, it makes life so easy because if you have, um, let's say you go to shop and you you buy like a pizza or a packet of chicken or something, you can literally open the MyFitnessPal app, hit, there's like a little barcode scanner feature. It'll open the camera on your phone. And then you literally just point the camera at the barcode. And within a split second, it'll bring up all the details for you. So that's one way that you could log your food to keep an eye on your protein throughout the day. That'd be the quickest way to do it. But then the other way would be when you are literally buying something, just quickly read the label and look at how many grams of protein are in it per hundred. So an example would be like earlier on, I bought some uh, sliced ham. So on the back of that, you know, it'll say per hundred grams, um, I think it was like, let's say 30 grams of protein per hundred. So in the packet was like 150 grams. So I know that like, okay, if it's 30 grams of protein per hundred and it's 150 grams in the packet, then it's going to be 45 grams of protein in total for the packet. So it does require like a little bit of, uh, maths, but it's really simple to do. So those would be the two main ways, either read the label or use my fitness pal and then you know, have that to kind of calculate how much, um, you know, protein or carbs or fats that you've had throughout the day. Um, Siobhan asked, have you a favorite brand for supplements? Um, yeah, the brand that I recommended there, Supplement Needs, because um, all of their formulations are done really well. Um, I spent about a year studying like nutritional biochemistry and really looking at, you know, how supplements are made and um, things like that. And you know, making sure that the supplement you're using actually has enough of what you want is really important because you'll see in a lot of supplements like, oh, there's vitamin B in this or there's like vitamin C or there's, you know, B12 or, you know, there's protein in this or whatever. But the thing is, there might be some of that vitamin or mineral or macronutrient in the food or the supplement, but how much you get might not actually be that much. So that's why it's really important to, you know, kind of buy from a company that actually gives you like what your body needs to really make a difference. Um, <clears throat> Siobhan asked, do you recommend a reduction in caffeine? For me, tea is the issue. Um, so tea has caffeine as well, generally about like 30 to 40 milligrams per cup. So easiest way to think about it is one, two cups of tea would generally equal, equal one cup of coffee. So there's, there's usually about 80 milligrams of caffeine per cup of coffee so the thing is you know um the only reason to reduce caffeine would be if you notice that your sleep is being affected like if you can't fall asleep you know at 10 or 11 or when you generally go to bed and you are drinking tea or coffee you know close to bed within three or four hours then it's probably a sign that yeah, the caffeine might be affecting your sleep. 
Um, but other than that, there's there's no real reason to um to to need to reduce you know tea or, or coffee. It's only as I said earlier, you know, sleep is literally the most important thing, number one thing that you have to focus on if you want to feel as best as possible. So you don't want anything unnecessarily interfering with that and then affecting how you feel the next day. Um, Ashley asked, any way to stop sugar cravings in the evenings? Uh, yes, there is for sure. So uh, if we go back to what slide did I mention that? Oh yeah, here we go. So I know I have the title of the slide is menstrual cycle considerations, but honestly, you could apply this to, it doesn't matter what stage of, of life you're in because these are really important across the board. So the easiest way to stop sugar cravings in the evenings is making sure that you've had enough protein and fat intake earlier on in the day. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, ideally per day, you want to have about 1.5 grams of protein per kg of body weight. But um, another simpler way to think about it is like, you want to ask yourself before you have a meal, you want to ask yourself, okay, where am I getting my 25 to 30 grams of protein in this meal? And then once you can answer that question, then you know you're going to be in a pretty good position because I can guarantee you if you have three meals across the day with 30 grams of protein, you're not going to feel hungry and you're not going to have cravings. And if you still do at that point, it might just be because you might actually need more. Like if you're really active or you've done like, you know, 10,000 steps or if you've done a workout or something that day. Um, but I can nearly guarantee for everybody, if you had 30 grams of protein per meal, you'd feel pretty good from that. That's what works well for the majority of women. Obviously not everyone, but for the majority. So um, my question to you, Ashleen, you can post it in the comments is how much protein are you getting per day in grams? And you can take your time to reply to that. Um, so Bridget, my mom asked, uh, my lifestyle is very stressful and tips on how to manage daily. Yeah, for sure. So uh, we just go back to how do you manage stress and mental health? So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven kind of things on the mental health uh, slide. But really, you know, the simplest thing when it comes to managing stress is just coming up with a self-care routine. So mom, what I'd like you to do is I want you to write down, as I said earlier, you know, write down five to 10 things that you find to be the most relaxing, what you enjoy doing. And then anytime you feel stressed in future, you need to go back to that list and pick out one or two or three of those things and then go and do it straight away. Um, or at least have it planned out that like, okay, as soon as I finish work, I'm going to go and do yoga. I'm going to go for a walk with the dogs. I'm going to go for a swim, um, have a bath, you know, whatever the thing is, like having that self-care routine is, is going to be really important. So the good thing is once you write it down, you can always come back to it. Um, so hopefully that's how that helps. Um, so Katrina asked, what about artificial sweeteners like stevia or plant-based? Um, yeah, so the thing with artificial sweeteners is like, like there's been some studies done that show artificial sweeteners cause uh, cancer in mice. But the thing that most people won't tell you is that for that actually to translate into humans, you would literally need to drink, you know, like something ridiculous, like 50 or 70 cans of Coke Zero every single day for like a year or something crazy. Like it's such a high amount that it's physically impossible to do it. So when it comes to stevia or aspartamine or artificial sweeteners or anything like that, you know, you can use them as an aid, you know? So if you, let's say, want to have a Coke Zero or you want to add some stevia into your tea or whatever, you know, that's actually going to help with reducing hunger and helping you feel a little bit fuller, especially, you know, if you have stevia with coffee or tea or have with some caffeine, but it's going to help reduce hunger a little bit. And obviously 
it's going to provide some sweetness to things as well. So it's probably going to be a positive because it's going to allow you to still have some sweet things. And then you don't even have to worry about the calories because there's literally zero calories in stevia or things like that. So it's a win-win situation, really, you know. Um, so definitely keep those in there. Um, so Ashin said, probably only have a protein once a day, small amount, unsure amount. Okay, so Ashin, what I'd like you to do, uh, go to the app store, download my fitness pal it's literally free um and then tomorrow i want you to like scan the barcode on some different foods that you're getting and then I want you to start aiming to get you know about you can do the calculation yourself but as i said about 1.5 grams of protein per kg of body weight um so once you have that number based off your body weight then i want you to aim for that amount of protein per day and then um the hunger and cravings should pretty much be gone at the evenings, but you can always, you know, send me an email with how you're getting on. Um, <clears throat> so Mags asked, what's the best exercise to help strengthen your bones? So um, really good question. So strength training, like the easiest way to think about it, a workout. So you, you need to put all of your bones or, you know, muscles through a certain amount of tension. So the easiest way to think about it would be a workout could literally be like some squats, planks, uh, some dumbbell rows, um, maybe some leg raises, um, some modified or assisted push-ups. Um, and then see the, the thing that the issue that you run into is because everyone has their own unique challenges. So I could give you five or six exercises that work really well. But the issue you run into is that if you've had injuries in the past with your knees, shoulders, hips, or whatever, then I couldn't really give you like an exercise in particular because that might cause you pain and then it might not be enjoyable and then kind of defeats the purpose. So um, really figuring out what exercises you can do that are enjoyable and you can also do pain-free and that you can progress on strength-wise um, while being pain-free is going to be the best way to improve your bone health. So a really simple example is, <laughs> Max said, yes, bonky knees. <laughs> okay, so, um, and I tore the cartilage of my knee uh, when I was like 14 or 15. So I constantly have knee pain if I, you know, do too many squats. So the thing is squats not, might not work, but to improve, you know, the strength in your legs, it might be a case of doing some different movements like uh, seated, like knee extensions or, straight leg raises something like that and um, i can always send you like some videos afterwards and um, that would explain what they are but that's going to be really important being able to find exercises that you can progress on so if we just take a squat for an example for example let's say you do a, a test today and the most amount of squats you can do with good form is 10 reps and then gradually over the next few weeks you keep doing squats like two or three times per week and you go from 10 to 15 to 20 to 25 and <clears throat> you gradually get higher and higher because you've gone from 10 reps to 25 reps you've definitely gained some bone strength because you if you hadn't have gained any strength you would still be stuck at 10 reps so you know your bones and your muscles and everything are getting stronger um as you're pushing yourself with the workouts and then, you know, you see your, <clears throat> your reps going up. So that's the easiest way to know that you're actually improving your bone strength or your bone density um, when you're seeing progress with your, your training numbers like that. So that's one of the reasons why it's important to um, keep a logbook or, you know, track the, um, the amount of reps you are getting, you know, in each session, essentially. All right, cool. So lots of good questions. Hopefully I've answered them uh, well enough in depth. Um, anyone else have any last questions they'd like to ask? Uh, you can turn on the mic and ask, or you can ask in the chat, like whatever suits. Every time I do a seminar or presentation, I always feel like I'm back in second class and <laughs> I'm the teacher and <laughs> I've got all the kiddies who are afraid to ask a question. <laughs> so Honestly, don't be afraid to ask a question. Like there's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, but hopefully I've been able to answer as many things as possible this evening. As I said earlier, you know, I want to give a wide, you know, kind of scope on things. 
Um, cool. So we'll end it there for today. Um, as I mentioned at the start, you know, the point of the seminar today is to help uh, Siobhan yeah. raise funds for um, for Tanzania. So if you'd like to donate, I'll um, I'll be sending the the link out afterwards, and it's on our social media as well. Um, and yeah, Siobhan, were you gonna jump in there? Yeah, just to say thanks a million, Ulan, for doing this for us. You're very welcome. Yeah, it's been brilliant. Um, thanks for everybody to join and the support. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much and hope everything goes well. well. Done. <laughs> I know well. you're very good anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Won't let it go to my head. Uh, no, don't worry not, about that. Not biased. All right, cool. Nice one. Well, thanks, Mel, for your time uh, this evening. Um, I'll be sending out the recording as well. Uh, so um, keep an eye out for that. And um, yeah, hope it was helpful. Great. Thanks, Alan. Cool. Thanks. Have a good evening. Thank you.